Today, we're going to kind of review, we're going to add a little bit to the managing, configure and managing data storage that we did in Windows 7. Nothing really dramatically different. And hopefully, you'll notice that I keep saying nothing dramatically different. There's nothing really dramatically different from these things from 2000 to 2003 to 2008. Now, having said that, let me backtrack real quick. Backup did change a little bit. We've gone to XML files instead of ADM files for, the, uh, for a lot of things. XML for most of the metadata files, for the description of the files, for the descriptions of the whatevers. Backup has changed somewhat. Backup has changed some from Vista to now. Vista was their first try at this one. It didn't have as much flexibility as we have now, but we do have a backup capability. And there's lots of, some of, speculation that the reason that they sort of went this way with these, with the backup is that most people on a larger scale use a third-party backup software instead of Windows backup software. Uh, well, part of this chapter is backup. Most of it is RAID managing disks, which we've done. We're going to add RAID 5 to the mix today. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to create a RAID in Windows. Uh, I'll post the video how to create a Windows RAID. It's done in Windows Server 2003. Not a whole lot of difference there. One of the differences is that to create a dynamic disk, term that you've heard before, in Windows 2008, uh, even on the C drive, you really don't have to reboot. It will it'll convert it for you. 2003 and prior, you had to convert it. History that you probably don't want, but you're going to get anyway. Uh, when this first happened, these dynamic disks first happened in Windows 2000, we'd do classes, and we would do all of this to do the labs to figure out what you could do with these things and do the conversions. In a large class, large class 10 to 15, I'd probably have at least one, maybe two failures on the conversion. That's not good because you're just converting the disk from one type to the other and you lose everything. XP didn't really have any. And in these, I have, didn't, didn't have, had inconsequential number, maybe one or two over all of the XP courses. Haven't had one fail in, in these in the 2008 and in the Windows 7. Now, part of that may be because we're using virtual machines, may be cleaner, may not be cleaner. <clears throat> but it seems to be a bulletproof operation now. If you have some old systems, you may find it's not a bulletproof operation. Before you convert to dynamic, it's going to say, it's going to give you a, a song and dance says that you're not going to be able to do certain operating systems, and you won't be able to do certain operating systems. The new ones you will be able to do uh, in those things. So the objectives for this one, understand the storage options for Windows Server 2008, basically the same ones we have. We can mirror, we can stripe, but now we can do a stripe with a parity bit. Parity bit allows us to restore the information if the uh, disk fails, if the hard disk itself fails. Use disk management tool to configure and manage storage. You've done that before. We'll do some more of that. Explain and configure RAID disk storage and fault tolerance. Two different types. The RAIDs that we are concerned about that we can manage with this, that we can create with this in the software, RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 5. RAID 0, Stripe, which you've done. RAID 1, a mirror or duplex, depending on how many controllers you have. And then a RAID 5 is a stripe with a parity. The parity bit allows you to recover your information if one disk fails. If two disks fails, you're out of luck. Understand storage enhancements in Windows Server 2008. Backup disk storage. We're back to the backup. And the backup is going to be similar to what you saw in Windows 7. It, it's going to be something that you have to install as a feature, not as a role, but as a feature in order to be able to do that. 
develop a backup and recovery strategy. This is something that we probably don't spend enough time on, and we probably won't spend enough time on here, but you really need to think about that when you're in a server environment. What is your backup strategy? What happens if everything suddenly goes away? And when we talk about this, and, and in the security class we'll talk about it a little bit more because it really is, the whole recovery system is a feature of part of the security planning that you would do. And when we talk about those things, you're not talking about, oh, a hard drive died. You're talking about you show up to work some morning and the building's not there. Now what? Now what? The building's not there. Burned down. The, the, the uh, sprinkling system got initiated for some reason and everything got wet. Now what? That's when we talk about backup and recovery, develop a backup plan. What are you going to do under those circumstances? How are you, the IT manager, going to recover? It would be part of the business plan, but it would be your part of it. There's more to it than just being able to get the computers back. What are you going to do? Where's your software? Where are your backups? Kind of like hot, cold, hot, cold, warm sites, yeah. But I mean, that that's a decision that we don't make as a hot, cold. Whether what we're going to do, whether we're going to have a hot site, warm site, or cold site, or, or any site. But once once you determine that the business is going to continue continuity of business, what are you going to do, IT manager? How are you going to get things back? Where are your backups? Andrew. I know one, you can have a remote backup server. You can have a lot of things. And, and there are lots of options today. There are lots of off-site options today. Off-site being a key word. If we had backup tapes, and we had backup tapes for the last 15 years, and they were in the same location, not necessarily a security issue, and they were in the same location as everything else, and we had a fire and the backup tapes burned, what's the big deal? Why, why have them? They need to be someplace else. In my opinion, and this is just opinion, off-site replication, probably one of the easier things to do, and there are lots of services, Carbonite advertisers, Unlimited, and I know they won't do it for a business, I'm sure, but for you, Carbon was $59 a year, I think, is what they're advertising now, where you can back up all of your data off-site, encrypted, where they actually give you the key. Dropbox, one of the things that you can use to store off-site. It's free for two gigabytes, I think, or something like that. They're not the only service that does it. It's just the one that I use, so I'm familiar with them. Huh? Acronis. Acronis, yeah. Dell has one. There are a number of them. Consider those things. For your personal files, consider those things. What happens if your hard drive, your, your personal computer crashes with all of your family photos on it? For those of you who are married, you may not be married much longer. Get all those baby pictures go away? Don't, don't do it, man. Don't do it. There are lots of places that will do that. You take advantage of those services. In the same token, what does it cost to do that? Backup plans, Andrew talked about you need an off-site. Yeah, you need an off-site. In this environment, ECPI of Tidewater Incorporated Environment, which Skyline is part of, there's lots of opportunities to have off-site backups because there's connectivity from all of the remote sites, all of the campuses, to Virginia Beach. Could do a backup there, and the Virginia Beach could pick wherever they wanted to and back up to those locations. So backup, is it a big deal? really can be. It's something that nobody cares about until you need it, and then if you need it and don't have it, you might as well update your resume. <laughs> So, because, I mean, honest to goodness, what happens if, really, if the building has a fire? 
How does the business stay in business? Why not? Why can't it? As long as I've got all of my information backed up someplace and I can restore everything and I can go rent an office building and there's lots of office space now that you could do that. The hardware itself not really the big issue because you can get a bunch of hardware and there are other things that, that we could do here obviously to make the hardware cheaper like thin clients, virtual machines, on and on and on and on and on to be able to do those things, remote apps, that kind of stuff. Uh, but what are you going to do? How are you going to do that? That's what we talk about, develop a backup and recovery strategy. Now I've done the whole backup and recovery strategy, so I want to get to the slides a little bit quicker. But backup, I said backup a lot. Recovery strategy. I've been to places to help people with a backup. I don't think it's working right. I don't think it's working. See if you can recover it. See if you can restore something from your backup tapes. I've been to places that people were running backups religiously every night and storing exactly zero bytes of data. It's easy to think you're doing it right and for it to not be right. But check to be sure you can actually restore it. If nothing else, that you know how to restore it. It goes back to my theory on all these tests and so on. Yes, you can look at questions all day long. but if you see a question and you don't know what it's asking, you don't know how to do it, go set it up and do it. Try it out. Just because you read the book and you say, oh, yeah, I got all the theory. Yeah, okay, great, you got all the theory. Now can you actually do it? <clears throat> Storage systems, terms that we talked about before, basic disks, the disk management techniques, primary and extended partitions, the dynamic disks, more flexibility, no restrictions on the number of volumes. Basic disk, we could have four partitions. We could have three primaries and an extended. You can actually have four primaries if you choose to do it that way. It says no restriction on the number of volumes. That's kind of true, because, but the no restriction means that you don't have drive letters on all your volumes. You are restricted by the number of letters in the alphabet. You can't go back and start with AA and AB and AC and work your way down from there. Basic disk partitioning blocks a group of tracks and sectors used by a particular start file system. Tracks and sectors, we put them together and manage them as a group, a grouping. The issue with this, with the partitioning, becomes how big are we making the clusters, <coughs> cluster being the term that we use in these. If it's a large cluster and one of the, we can waste a lot of disk space because if we have, oh let's say we have 64k clusters or whatever size cluster and we have a lot of really really tiny files you know that you're, you're saving some little tiny, all of them have a name, little, little tiny uh, log files or whatever, you're going to run out of space because each of those 5K files requires 64K of space in order to store them because there's no cluster sharing available in Windows. Some operating systems have cluster sharing available. They may get to that. So blocks the uh, tracks and sectors used for a particular file system. Formatting creates a table, prepares the disk for use is what, what we say. What formatting does is creates a structure so that it can find the files so they can point to the files based on the clusters that we created previously. A volume is a logical designation of a disk storage created out of one or more physical disks. A number of ways to do that. If you want to, if you need to extend it and you have free space, you can extend it from one volume to the other, one physical disk to the other. Recognize primary and extended basic disks. This is the one that I wanted to try out and I did try out before we started because said, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. It says basic disks can be configured for any of the RAID levels, striping 0, 1, or 5. Give it a shot. Well, the answer is kind of. But when you get done, you know what? You get this nice little window. You know what it says? 
I left my window. Let's see if I can get back to my window. <clears throat> if I can get back to my machine. The operation you selected will convert the selected disks to dynamic disks. Yes, you can do that. You can right click on it and say create a RAID 5 and it says okay I'll do that and when you get done it says oh by the way I gotta convert the disks to basic disk. You can have a hardware RAID on your basic disk but the software RAID, all the clever stuff, the, the RAIDs have to be dynamic disks. So. I guess that we'll give them a sort of true on that one, but not really. You can start it, but you can't finish it until you actually convert these things. RAID, re redundant array of inexpensive. Sometimes you'll see the I as independent disks. What we do is put a bunch of disks, several disks, 2 to 32 for uh, RAID 1. 3 to 32 for RAID 5 because you have to have a parity disk. In RAID 5 we lose, they've got a formula, 1 over x, da, 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 on and on and on. The bottom line is you lose one disk's worth of storage space in a RAID 5. If you have three disks, you lose one third of your storage. If you have 30 disks, you lose one thirtieth of your storage. You lose one disk's worth of storage in a RAID 5. A RAID 1, you require 2 to 32 disks. A RAID 1 has no redundancy. A RAID 1 is faster. Faster read, faster write. All you gamers, RAID 1. A RAID 5 has to write to parity stripe. Probably going to have faster read, slower writes. The, uh, this striping, or di well, I got this backwards, didn't I? This mirroring RAID level 1, RAID 0. Zero is the first one, which is striping with no parity, but that's the 2 to 32. Let's start over. Raid zero, and I, and I, and I knew that. I don't, know why. Don't, know, don't know why I said it that way, and it clearly says it right here. Just striping, raid zero, faster reads and writes, but no redundancy. If any of your disks fail in a raid zero, put a new disk in, rebuild the raid, and restore from backup. Raid one is mirroring or duplexing, depending on how many disk controllers you have. If the disks are running on the same controller, it's a mirror. If they're running on separate controllers, it's duplexing. The issue there being that if you are mirroring on the same controller and the controller fails, you lost both disks. So you really would prefer that they be separate channels, separate complete channels for each of those makes a complete copy of whatever you do. Windows has the ability, and it's really kind of neat, that you can go onto your C drive, for instance, and right click on it and sell it to create a mirror for you. And it'll create a mirror for you. And then when you restart it, it gives you two options as to which drive you want to start. You want to start the drive, the original, operating system or do you want to start the mirror? This gives you the ability to just simply change where it boots from and you can continue to run. You lose a lot of this storage, like half of it, because you have a copy of everything that you do. But mirror does have redundancy. One of the raids that is popular that comes on a lot of the servers now, and most of the servers today will come with a controller, a RAID controller on it so that you can do a physical RAID instead of a operating system RAID is a RAID 1-0. Where you get the speed of the RAID 0, got to get, gotta get the numbers right, and the redundancy of RAID 1. Takes, well, it takes a lot of disk space though. You're still going to lose half of your disk space. The server that we're running the virtual machine's on, the volume of the virtual machine's on is a RAID 1-0. So we do have some redundancy if we have disk failures. You could also 
run a mirror a, if you really are concerned because remember in the array to zero any disk failure you lose everything in that particular array but in this case we would have it mirrored if you really wanted redundancy we could have a raid 5 that was mirrored in a raid 5 you're allowed to lose one disk one physical disk and you can rebuild a raid it will actually keep running using the parity stripe it will run slower because it has to create the data every time that it needs it you can in a raid 5 have one physical disk failure replace that disk and and rebuild it and if you think about it that kind of goes back to some of the hardware stuff that we may or may not have do we have hot disk swap are we going to have to shut the server down when we're talking in raid when you're talking in these terms can you bring that server down in order to do that or do you need to buy the hardware that supports all the other stuff that we do in those things striping spread it over multiple disks Mirror and create a mirror image of all the data on the original disk. MBR and GPT support, we talked about those, the GUID, the master boot record and the GUID. Uh, master boot record to start up information about partitions and how to access the disk. Where is the active partition? Where's the operating system kind of deal? Partition table information about each partition that it creates. The GUID, the GPT, the Globally Unique Identifier, newer way to partition disk. Part of the Unified Extension Firmware UEFI approach, and this is something that now many of the, I guess most of the servers actually have it, uh, that built into it. Part of, it's part of the BIOS. One of the things that will happen, because we've done it, if you try to create a partition that's two terabytes or above, it's automatically going to default to a GPT partition. Although NTFS claims, and if you go back in history, claims that it can manage multiple terabytes, that's not nearly as efficient as the GPT file system. The larger disks are going to be GPT. Store the partition information in each partition using main and backup tables that's always good to have a main and backup tables. DOS had a main and backup table, and they were on track zero, one right after the other. And one back to one updated the other one. So if one got infected, the other one got infected along with it. If, if track zero went away, everything went away. NTFS, a little bit better. Its, it's file table is not necessarily going to be on sectors or track zero. The uh, GPT partition can theoretically be up to 18 exabytes. Look it up. A lot. I think an exabyte, uh, exabytes a thousand, thousand terabytes. I think a petabyte, uh, yeah, a petabyte's a thousand, thousand terabytes, right? Yeah, and then an exabyte. And an exabyte's a thousand petabytes. So it's a thousand, thousand terabytes. A lot. It's a number there. It's a lot. It's a, it's, yeah, it's one of those numbers that I wish I had that many dollar bills. You couldn't count it all. Huh? You couldn't count it all. You yeah, you're right, but that's okay. I can handle that. But can convert an MBR disk to a GPT and vice versa, but it has to be an empty disk. If it's got data on it, you can't convert it. Yes. Do we even have anything that's an no. There are professional storage companies that I don't know if they're doing I don't know if they're managing exabytes yet but they're managing multiples of petabytes you gotta remember some of these storage companies I mean carbonite the commercial one how much storage do you think those guys got if they're if they're allowing you to have unlimited storage they probably have thousands, of petabytes. Uh, thousands I bet they got thousands of petabytes Yeah, but are you going to are you going to make a single partition petabyte? I guess the answer is maybe. I don't, I don't know that you really would want to do that because if you lose a terabyte's worth, you ever, you ever think about if you lost a terabyte's worth of information, how much you actually lose? Now let's lose a petabyte worth of information. It would take a long time. It would take a long time. Can you imagine doing that backup? It would take days to back that up. It take 
much to back that up. But so, and when we start talking about these much larger storage devices, and back to the let's think, let's, let's always keep them in the back of our minds the backup and restore. What technique are you going to use? And I'll tell you for a fact, having done it, backing up and restoring, backing up the home directories and then restoring them on a different server, it takes a whole lot longer to restore than it does to back up. So you may want to look at some sort of a synchronization. Windows gives you that ability with the distributed file system. It's one of the ways to do that. You've got to have the storage devices. You've got to have the disks. But disks in the larger scheme of things are pretty cheap. I know the price went up with the floods in Thailand, but they'll come back down. But we can convert these things, MBR, to GPT if we want to. Primary and extended partitions on the MBR, the primary partition can boot an operating system. The active partition is where it looks for the operating system. Extended partition is created in space that's not yet partitioned. The extended partition was really, as far as I can tell, designed to be used in DOS when we had 2 gig, right? 2 gigabytes Basically, yeah, two gigabytes, I think, basically for the active partition. Then we had these big hard drives. What do you do now? Well, you can make an extended partition to use the rest of the disk space and then create individual drive letters, individual two gigabyte drive letters, because that's all it can manage, uh, on the extended partition and use all of your drive space. So we still have that. And keep in mind that. It, however you want to divide your disk up, when you get done, you, you, you have an extended partition that just like takes over the rest of the available space on the disk and you make drive letters inside it. Yes? I'm still kind of confused a little on how the volumes work within the partition. How the volumes work within the partition? A volume is really a term that we normally associate with dynamic disk. The difference between a volume and a partition <coughs> is mostly what goes on on the internals. You can think of them the same way. To us, the action is going to be the same. The difference to us is going to be that once we convert to dynamic disk, we're going to have volumes, although 2008 says volumes are really creating partitions on the basic disks. Uh, we're going to have volumes, which allows us to do the RAID arrangements. That, and that's what you, you get more efficiency more efficiency to us is not that big a deal. More efficiency when we're running that server with 100 virtual machines on it, disk efficiency becomes kind of a big deal. So on the basic disk, the basic disk is a partition. You're, you're, you're not going to really see any difference unless you try to do a RAID or something like that, and it's going to tell you how to convert the disk. Primary partition, nice picture here. Primary NTFS partition, NTFS partition, NTFS partition. We have four of those in here. Disk zero, disk one, partitions on two disk drives, unformatted extended partition. We can do that however we want to back these or create these things, structure them, keeping in mind that if we're a master boot record, four is the maximum that we can go to. Dynamic, until you run out of drive letters. And if you do like a mounted disk, if you mount it to a folder, you don't give it a drive letter, do you? That's how you can get to the, quote, unlimited number of volumes because we don't have an unlimited number of drive letters that we can, that we can do with these things. Volume set, two or more partitions that are combined to look like one volume in a single drive letter. What we do, and you're going to go through and create some of these things, what we do is if we did a stripe and we used two volumes of a disk, it would be formatted as a single volume, have a single drive letter. If we did with a stripe set, the volume set, whatever we do, the RAID 0, the RAID whatever we do with this thing, regardless of how many disks, and how much space that we use in these, we're going to put this thing together and make it appear as a 
single drive wire. The advantage to the RAIDs are you can have simultaneous reads and writes to multiple physical disks, multiple within the structure of a single drive letter. So don't use it. Set up a large number of volumes on one disk. Can be formatted of NTFS. Convert basic disk to dynamic disks after you install Server 2008. The operating system itself has to be installed on a basic disk. Kind of makes sense because it's a basic disk. That maintains the characteristics, continues to have the characteristics of a basic disk, that partition of a basic partition, even after you do the conversion. But the initial one has to be on a basic disk because we don't have an operating system to convert it to a dynamic disk and on and on and on. The operating system itself actually does a lot of management inside, inside of those things. Simple volume is a portion of a disk or the entire disk that is set up as a dynamic disk. Span volume, 2 to 32 dynamic disks, a span volume. If we wanted to build one of those petabyte volumes, we could take 1,000 terabyte hard drives. Actually, we couldn't because we can only go up to 32. But we could take 32 terabyte drives or however big the drives are and get a 32 terabytes worth of storage. What you do is connect those things end to end, figuratively. Yeah, and if you lose 32 terabytes, you really lost a lot. But you connect those things end to end, and they appear as a single 32 terabyte volume. The problem with a span volume is, let's say that the 32nd drive fails and you only have 20 terabytes worth of information. And it gets filled up from end to end, from the beginning straight down the line to the end. Was that happening in a SCSI drive? What was SCSI drive? No, it had to be something. I mean, you're not going to have, you're not going to have 32 IDE drives, but you, you could have something like that. What happens if you lose one disk, you lose all of your storage. Because I thought it can only go up to 1,500 drives on one computer. Well, see, those, those, things, you get, those things you get into how you're going to manage it. Yeah. But when you get into disk arrays, you get specialized equipment. You're, you're thinking in still small terms. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When the span, can you back up each individual drive? No. It's a span. It's a single volume. It's all one volume. That's what I said. If we had 32 one terabyte drives, we have a 32 terabyte volume. If any drive in that span fails, you lost everything. It's gone. Unless you backed it up and restored from backup. And how long is it going to take you to back up and restore 32 terabytes? This is there, and, and this kind of goes back, I think, to when we had much, and it's been around for a long time, goes back to when we had much smaller hard drives, and you needed bigger volumes. You've been able to do span drives for a long time. With the drives that we have now, are you and I going to need to have span volumes? I, maybe, but I'm not going to, I'll tell you that. No, I'll do a RAID configuration. We can do a RAID. Well, that is a RAID configuration. It's just not have any redundancy. Striped volume, we've talked about the RAID 0, which I got my numbers confused the first time, but the RAID 0, the first one, and this is, a, this is kind of the way that I remember them. RAID 0 has no redundancy. It was the first one, <clears throat> but it's faster. RAID 1 is the next one, the more basic one. It's a mirror or a duplex, depending on how many controllers you have. RAID 5, a little bit more sophisticated. Multiple disks can take one failure when we go into these things. Okay, here's your spanned volume, Andrew. When we take these, and this one has an 80 and 80, 100, 124, 380 gigabytes of storage space. When you span this thing, don't think about these as individual drives. This is now one gigantic drive letter. It's a 380 gigabyte H drive or a G drive or whatever else volume. And if one of these fails, even if we've filled up 80 gig, we've only got to this drive and the 120 gig fails, 
everything's gone. Because it's formatted as a volume, it has to be able to find the end of it. Discs in a striped array, the disc stripes here, the one, two, three, four, five. <coughs> Part of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'll get it. Part of a part of the file is stored on each disk, and these have simultaneous reads and simultaneous writes. That's what makes them faster. If we had a RAID 5 in here, we'd have a parity. We'd have a storage, a parity, a store. Par parity is distributed across all of the different volumes, and the parity allows you to re is, a, is a code that allows you to recreate the data. Yes. If row one, disk one fail, you'd lose that data. You'd lose that data because there's no parity. There's no redundancy in a RAID zero and just a straight stripe. The straight volume would still work. Straight volume still but what happens if you have a bad sector in your single volume hard drive? What happens to that data? I don't know. Mike. What happens to that data? goes away. What happens if you have <clears throat> a bad spot on this drive? That data goes away. <clears throat> That's why you just use that computer just for gaming. That's why you use that computer <laughs> just for gaming, okay. <clears throat> One of the other things that you can do, and I'll probably ask you to do next week, and you kind of sort of always could do it, but it didn't work as cleanly as it does here, is you can shrink the volume. Because by default, Windows 7 and the servers, whatever drive, whatever disk you put it on, says, oh, I'll just take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And most of us don't go in and say, oh, you can create the partitions when you start, but most of us don't do it. So you get there and you say, yeah, I may want to do something else. You can shrink the volume. I've actually noticed well, yeah, it creates, it creates at least two partitions. It creates a tiny partition, an unusable tiny partition. I agree. But let's talk in reality. A usable partition, how's that? And it doesn't always create the two. Just take a look at them. Most of the times it does. It says it will, but I've noticed that the ones that you guys are creating doesn't always do that. But you can shrink that partition for all except the 12 megabytes that it doesn't use for James's benefit here. So if you get one of these things and you have this really large hard drive, and all of a sudden you say, I want to create, I've got three disks and now I want to create a RAID 5, and you need three disks to create a RAID 5, you can shrink the volume and uh, create your RAID 5. They'll tell you how much, how much shrinkable space that you have needed and you don't have extra disks. Yes, we can do that. The disk management tool, central location, performing tasks. If you add a disk, you're going to have to activate the disk. You got, first, you probably have to bring it online and you're going to have to activate it. When you do the, these labs, I think you've got enough disks. If you don't, we can add them. But right now, all you probably see when you go to my computer is the C drive. Is that safe to say? There are other disks there. When you go into the disk management tool, you should be able to activate. Well, first, I think you have to bring them online, and once you get them both on, all, get them online, you can then activate them. Uh, activate them. Once you activate them, then you've got disks that are ready to partition whatever you're going to do with them. Leave one megabyte or more of the disk space free. Needs to convert a basic disk to a dynamic disk in case you want to upgrade later. And that's that's what that partition that James is saying that we do have to. Yes, we do have to. Left available for Windows at least one megabyte. So we're not going to be able to do a whole lot with that, with that tiny, tiny, tiny partition. It's for conversion for Windows use for disk management. And when you do the conversions, they actually, I think it puts a little bit of information in there so it knows what to do with it. Because you ever think about booting on a dynamic disk, the operating system got to manage the disk and you go around in these things. you got to have something somewhere for it to, uh, for it to start with. 
Did what? Turned my hard drive to dynamic limitation. Yeah, it's no big deal. It didn't do anything. No, it doesn't do it. does not do anything. And the management, it used to because I did that with Windows 2000, and then I ran out of space on the C drive. And at that time, there weren't many any disk utilities that you could really use on dynamic disks. There are now to change the size of the partition. So how do you recover from that one? <laughs> mounted disk. Mounted disk. You can use a mounted disk on a, on on either a basic or a uh, or a dynamic. You don't really want to, and there's no need to convert it back. You can convert it back, and the uh, steps are one: back up all of your data; two: repartition the hard drive; format it; three: restore from backup. So yes, you can recover, but there's no convert, unconvert type of arrangement. Once you convert it, it's there unless you back it up and restore it. I think it's funny that I did that now, but at the time I was freaking yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, it does. It, it's panicky, like, what the heck have I done now? Nothing. That's in your bugging Nothing. Bugging. What you've really done is, is converted it so that it can do all of the clever stuff. You can now make raids and do those kind of things with it. You used to, I believe, and don't don't quote me, say, oh yeah, you lied to me. I think in 2003 you actually had to convert it to dynamic before you could change, before you could do the shrink and the change within Windows, change the size of the uh, partition. So be certain that one megabyte before available on the disk, so you had at least one megabyte free when you did the conversion and you didn't have any problem. Converting the basic to the dynamic, and this is another one of those things that's one of those enormously difficult Windows things, you click in the gray space out there, right click in the gray space and tell it to convert. When I converted the last C drive, it didn't make me reboot. You used to have to reboot when you did the season. Those are the ones that occasionally in 2000 we would have the failures. XP rarely the failures, and now I really haven't had any, any failures. It doesn't, it doesn't ask you to reboot now. A mounted drive appears as a folder. Been there, done that. Create a blank folder, create a new partition, I tell you want to mount it, go to the folder. It has to be empty. One of the labs in Windows 2000, and I guess the problem with being here this long is you remember too many things, had you create this folder and put a bunch of stuff in it that now mount it. Well, you can't do it. It has to be empty. That's a way if you have your C drive gets really, really full which mine did in Windows 2000, and I didn't have any way to extend it. What was the way out? Mounted drive, because that storage space is now on a different physical volume, but you access it through the C drive. You can put a lot of stuff there. Unfortunately, you can't do the program files because it's a system file, or I couldn't, I couldn't then anyway. Say again? It's like a shortcut within one drive to another drive. It's like a door from one drive to the other drive. Yeah, without it's not a shortcut. Directly. Shortcut just refers you to something else. Uh, this actually is storage, seen as storage on that drive. So think of it more as a doorway to the other partition. Does that feel like a hard link? No, a hard link actually links to a file, doesn't it? This gives you access to storage, it's like a it's like it's like a new volume without a drive letter. Yeah. But it's a way to for things to appear to be on one drive, but where they're actually physically stored in another location. Can mount basic dynamic disc CD CD DVD removable drive. And I think one of the things that you want to put in here, you can also mount virtual hard drives on this thing in the in the disk management. If you right click mount, you can mount a virtual hard drive. You can create virtual hard drives in there also. So you can mount those things. If you have something, if you're running virtual hard drives and you need to make a change to it, add something to it, modify it in some way, you can mount it in your file system and make the changes unmounted and then go back and use it. Home directory or home folder, 
associated with the user's account designated workspace, and, and we'll talk about more, I think, about how to do these things in Active Directory. One of the ways to do them, the, one, the way that they're done here is with a script. You, we uh, give you a drive ladder. You can also do it in the properties of the user where you specify where the, where the home directory is or use a mounted drive. Fragmenting and defragmenting, been there, done that. Right click, fragment, defragment. Fragmented, not contiguous. Contiguous being that you can more quickly access the files. So the reason that happens is because we delete stuff. And the disk drives access the storage space as it encounters the storage space, the available storage space. So you might wind up with parts of a file all over a hard drive. And if we've got a terabyte hard drive, we'll go back to those things. We may have a lot of different locations that they can be in. Defragmentation makes them contiguous so that you minimize the movements of the read-write heads. You defragment it. That's what defragmentation is all about, is to make the individual files contiguous. Oh, I'll try that on my computer. To defragment, you go to the tools and say defragment. I do, and then or run the def or run the command defrag c colon. Yeah, Windows 7 defrag is set up automatically. Yeah, yeah, Windows 7 does it all exactly on Wednesdays, right? Windows 7 defragments at three o'clock, I think, in the morning on Wednesdays. Yeah, it 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 got automatically scheduled when you install Windows 7. Defragmentation is a process that gets a lot of press. And yeah, you need to do it. How often you need to do it? Don't know the answer to that. I guess the real answer to that depends on how many things that you put on and take off, how many times you delete files. If you don't do a lot of file deletion, you're not going to have a lot of fragmentation. Keep in mind that when you do that, you're going to be driving those read-write heads crazy. If you have a lot, and a lot of times you go there and it says, well. I'd it's like 5% fragmented. Okay, probably don't need to do that. But it does make disk access quicker. And I think that as we get bigger and bigger and bigger hard drives, defragmentation becomes more and more and more significant because you've got more territory to put things in to tell the read-write has to go, go get it. Go, go get it. So where is it going to be? Uh, it depends on how big the disk is. The answer is maybe not. How big the disk? How big disk? How How much space is on the disk? How long? How much time does it take to defrag empty space? Not much. Not much. Depends on how much is on it. How fragmented it is. Jason said. Corruption is different. Corruption is different. Different tool. Check disk. Started from the command prompt. May run automatically. Probably not going to run automatically on your system drive because Windows has a hard time fixing stuff while it's running. Probably on your system drive is going to say, I can't, can't unmount this drive. Do you want to run it at the next reboot or do you want to reboot now and run it? But check disk checks for corrupted files. Defrag just tries to make the files contiguous. The different switches that we have here. Fault tolerance, ability of the system to gracefully recover from hardware or software failure. That's a nice term, isn't it? Hard drive fails, can we get our data back? Can we keep running? Actually, fault tolerance doesn't mean can we get our data back. Fault tolerance is different from backup. Fault tolerance means that you're working on your virtual machine and one of the disks fails, can the operating system, can you continue to work on it? Fault tolerance, until we can get the disk replaced, the physical disk replaced, and get that information rebuilt. Software raids, not, not meant as a replacement for performing backups. And we talked about backups early on. Where is your backup? Well, the fault tolerance is going to be sitting right there on the server. So that if the, if the uh, sprinkler system floods the server, or if you have a fire in the server room, 
your fault tolerance just went up in flames. And if your backup tape is sitting right there beside it, so did it. Your backup should be stored off-site. Always stored off-site. Well, you could have like a vault. Well, I know. They talk about a vault. Yeah, a vault. And we've talked about that. We actually have a vault in the building up here that's supposed to be fireproof. And that might work. But you're going to be much safer having it off-site. One of the things that happened in the 9-11 uh, tragedy was a lot of those places had backups. And there was a company that came in and did backups. And you know where the backups were? They were a different building, but they were in the World Trade Center area. A lot of backups got destroyed along with all of the other information. Yeah, a, number of, a number of the, uh, there were some companies that actually had done all of the, Preparation had done the uh, evacuations, had done the drills. Had a, obviously had a hot site because there were a couple of uh, firms, mutual fund firms that were up and running in New Jersey the next day. Yeah, New York Harbor was. They were up and running like yeah. four hours later in yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. How much is it worth? How critical is the data? How much is the company willing to spend? for insurance, and that's what you're really talking about. How much are you going to spend for insurance? Well, if you make a backup to a removable hard drive that just stays plugged in on the USB port all the time, probably not going to be very successful. That will eventually fail. Well, maybe, maybe not, but the issue is if you, if you need the backup, then the backup probably got burned up with everything else. Backup, something that won't pay a lot of attention to? I don't pay. How much attention do you pay to it at home, really? I have a lot of things on my uh, Dropbox folder, but I don't have it. If, if a couple of the hard drives failed, I'd, I'd have an issue. So I guess I better do a better job. Huh? Maybe, all of you, maybe all of us should do a better job. But redundancy does not replace the backup. Hopefully we got through that point. The RAID volumes, I think we already maybe addressed these early on in the objectives, talk about what each of them are. Six levels, striping, mirroring, duplexing, support RAID level 0, 1, and 5. Mirroring or duplexing are basically the same depending again on how many disk controllers you have. If you have separate disks, in the mirror, in the duplex on separate controllers, it's a duplex found the same controller, it's a mirror. Striping, we can have the RAID 0 striping, which has no parity bit, the RAID 5 striping, which has a parity bit. RAID 5, you can lose one hard drive. One, one hard drive can fail. You lose one hard drive's worth of storage. You don't lose any storage in a RAID 0. You lose 50% of your storage in mirroring and duplexing because you have to have a copy of all of those things. And this is the mirroring, same controller, duplexing, separate controllers. The real difference in those. RAID 0, reduce wear and tear multiple disks, equally spreading the load. Increased disk performance compared with other methods of configuring dynamic disks. Faster reads, faster writes. Uh, a RAID, uh, uh, RAID 1 mirror or duplex creates a copy of all the data. And you can, in Server 2008, Windows 7, Server 2003, and I don't remember if you could in XP or not, if you, if you have an empty disk, you can go to your operating system, to your C drive, right-click and tell it to create a mirror. And then you specify the disk to create the mirror on and it will create that mirror for you automatically. Pretty good deal. Pretty quick way to do the mirror. So it does all of that for you. Only on dynamic disk, which is a little different than they said in the earlier slide, isn't it? God be, you can start it, but it's going to, it's going to convert them. You, you have to be on dynamic disk to do the clever stuff. Mission critical, RAID 5, minimum of three disks. Performance not as fast as a stripe volume, 
you're probably going to have faster reads and slower writes because when you write the information, it has to create the parity bit. The parity bit allows the data, it's code that allows recreation of the data if one disk fails. If two disks fail, restore from backup. Recreate the array and restore from backup. So it only allows failure of one physical disk. RAID 5, and they're showing the parity block, parity block spread out across the disks here. So it has this, the parity block allows recreation of the data if one disk fails. Software array, fault tolerance to the server's operating system. The operating system itself then, since it creates us through the operating system, the operating system itself can't be on a software array. It can be on a hardware array if you want to do that. The raids have gotten faster. Originally, first time we put the operating system on a hardware array, it actually slowed down a little bit because of the creation. We did RAID 5, did the creation of the parity stripe. If you mirror it, yeah, I don't think you'll notice any difference. A mirror is probably the way you want to go with the operating system because if a physical disk fails, you don't lose all of that. And it's, again, it is easy to, to create. As you're doing these labs, and I don't think they actually have you do that, give that one a shot. Just right-click just to see the process. You don't have to, to actually let everything uh, get synchronized. But just so you see the process. A hardware RAID, many servers, and I guess even now some uh, desktops come with built-in RAID controllers, allow you to create a hardware RAID. And I think that most of them probably, at least the ones that we've gotten, the servers we've gotten, generally support a RAID 1.0. I haven't seen any that supported a, 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 a 0.5 or a 5.0. That's just the servers that we get. Storage area networks are something that are a little different. I heard the term iSCSI a few minutes ago. And Windows comes with a built-in built iSCSI initiator. Initiator is a thing that tries to initiate contact with an iSCSI target. The target runs on the server. And what you really have, at least in Windows, actually in all of them, I think, you create virtual hard drives within a much larger storage area. And you can connect via an IP address and an authorization to storage via the network. The virtual server server that we run obviously has a limited amount of storage space. It has an iSCSI partition. You need to create your iSCSI partitions on a private network with high-speed connectivity. Giga Gigabyte NICs, 10 gigabyte NICs, something like that, because that can slow down, A, your network if you have it on the outside, and B, your data storage if you don't have anything fast enough. We initially set one up on a uh, Linux machine with a 100 megabyte, and it was pretty unsatisfactory. Right now we're running on a, on a back-end gigabit NIC on both of them that allows large frames, uh, giants. You're not necessarily constrained to the 1500 byte frame size. You can configure both ends to accept larger frame sizes. Speeds up the data transfer that way. Multiple paths for storage tolerance. Starwinds, if you want to try out <coughs> just to learn how to do it, Starwinds has a free downloadable SCSI arrangement that you can on your virtual machine, on your physical machine, create a nice SCSI partition. They have a commercial one. Their free one allows you to create up to uh, two terabytes of storage, which is probably about all you're going to need. You don't have to create a two terabyte, but that's the maximum size that that one will create. If you need something larger, you have to pay for it. But that's kind of a good way to learn how to use these things without going and buying a Microsoft storage server. Storage servers have the uh, target on it, and that's been the problem, Starwinds. But multiple paths for, for fault tolerance, the uh, storage area network 
And, and one of the things that you could do with an iSCSI partition is we could create a cluster because we can have shared storage in these things. And you have to configure it for multi-path in order to allow that to happen. SANs and LUNs, I guess that I guess that I jumped ahead on the SAN, the network, I just go back to network area storage. You buy the hard drive and plug it into your network. We have one of those. It kind of works okay. But it's just a storage that's attached. Storage on a server is network attached storage. Storage area network, NAS and SANs, too many letters going in different directions. iSCSI fiber channel or iSCSI. iSCSI going to obviously be less. Fiber channel you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on or more. Storage area networks, logical unit numbers, the LUNs for small computer systems interfaces. And again, we have those. We're running them in the building here, iSCSIs. We used to have, and I think I probably showed you guys one time, that Linux machine over there that just had a bunch of disks in it. We had one that was storage. It's, it, we moved on to some other storage area, storage areas in that. But Linux, you can do this with Linux. You can do it with Windows. You can, you can configure them. Linux, obviously, not as easy to configure as the Windows one. Windows is all through the GUI Linux. You have, actually have to know what you're doing in order to make it work. Logical unit number is the LUN is just the, basically the identification. What you do when you create these things is you create a virtual hard drive, the target, and you tell the target which IP addresses are allowed to connect to it. There are other securities that you can do. You can, ask, you can have passwords. Uh, you can have chat, those kinds of things, authentication in order to get onto it. The thing that, and you, I guess you can do it through a VPN if you really want to encrypt it, but keep in mind that when you do a storage area network, if you use an iSCSI, and iSCSI just basically SCSI connected via Ethernet instead of a SCSI cable, you don't want to put it, you don't want to allow that traffic on your network. For one thing, somebody can be sitting there, well, Trevor's sitting there running uh, Wireshark, getting all your information, plus the fact with the amount of network traffic that it takes to actually transfer something back and forth, you're going to slow your network down substantially. So if you, if you do that, it should be on a private network that only connects the server to the storage server. Types of LUN, simple, span, stripe, mirrored, stripe of parity. Same thing we've talked about here. Virtual disk service, management of disk volumes and SANs through one or more interface at a server when we go through these things. Storage manager for SANs, three windows of operation, multipath I.O. This would be the one if we, if we were going to cluster it, that if one failed, the other one would take over. We would have to... And this is another one of those really difficult things. You go into properties and check the box that says multi-path multi I.O. I would warn you, we have had, personal experience, some issues, and that's because we had too many people trying to manage a partition, an iSCSI LUN, that was connected to more than one computer. They, not all, but a couple of them eventually just said, thank you, but no thank you, we're done. When you do these things, unless, you're, unless you set it up in a, uh, in a clustering arrangement, you probably only want to want one LUN, one target attached to one machine. Six miles. Some disk backup. Have I beat that one up enough, disk backups? Backup and redundancy are separate entities. Backup typically is going to be, not typically, backup should be off-site somewhere. If you have multiple buildings, on the Blue Ridge we had multiple buildings, we'd back up the servers and take them to another physical part of the city and stored the backups there. You had to do it on a daily basis, kind of a pain in the rear, because now you've got to drive that tape to wherever you're going to store it. 
if you have off-site replication might be a little bit easier. And off-site replication probably going to get you back in business quicker than backup and restore. The reason that we still use backup and restore, the reason we still use tape is it's well understood. Lots of storage, very portable, very transportable. Some businesses have a legal requirement to back up. And when you get to those, be sure that you're complying with all the regulations. And I'm going to say what they are because, A, I don't know them all, and B, they're going to change tomorrow. But what regulations are you required? What are you required to do in your backup? And there are some things that are requirements. It can be stored on a single backup media, one administrator responsible for backing up multiple servers. And we have the backup server operators, uh, yeah, the backup server operators that are allowed to back up and restore data. They can't read the data that they backed up, but they can back up and restore it. If you get into one of these situations, and I know I keep coming up with all these stories, had a letter or an email or a something from a credit card company, I think it was, that we may have lost your information. Well, these guys back up and they ship their backup tapes on UPS or FedEx or U.S. Mail. They lost the backup tape. They eventually found the backup tape. They're not very big. It got stuck under something. But how do you get it there? Did you encrypt? Do you encrypt your backup information? Consider those things if you're going to put them on some sort of a public carrier. Are you going to back up? You're going to back up, put it on a public carrier. Is it encrypted? You may want to consider it. It's going to take more time. Encryption is going to take more time for both the backup and the restore. It's all a risk reward. How much risk are you willing to take? Do do those things, huh? Doing it how what way? Shipping them? Yeah. Well, it's 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 a lot it's it's a lot better. It's a lot better than not having one. If you don't if you don't have it, if you're not complying with your fiduciary responsibilities and shipping them to some place else. How much time are you willing to spend in jail? The VA has an incident not too long ago with a bunch of our medical files and everything they were transferring. And Actual, they have all sort they've had all sorts of one. Are you talking about the one where they lost all the uh, the three hundred thousand or whatever social security numbers? Oh well more than just social security numbers. Yeah, but that's, see, that's generally people that have information stored on their laptops that they're violating the policy with. It was backed up on secure tape and stolen out of the carrier's car. Yeah, that could be. They had an incident a few years ago in Australia where instead of just trying to hack into the servers, they just walked in with a clipboard and stole the servers. <laughs> Got a lot of time to look at them then. That's part of the foreign disk business. That's part of, James found out, with BitLocker. When he, you, you, did your, you did your BitLocker to go or so. Or, yeah, bit, yeah, with BitLocker. If you put it in a different, if you put it in, and those are all things that you've got to consider. What are you going to do with all this stuff from a security standpoint? I mean, this is not a security class, but... When we're talking about disk, what are you going to do from a security standpoint for all of these things? What happens if somebody steals the server? What happens if somebody steals the hard drive? What happens if the disk, if it's encrypted, it shouldn't really be that big a deal as long as you didn't send the uh, the private key along with it? Well, they can break the encryption eventually. Well, the answer to that is probably, and most encryptions have been broken, but most of us don't run around with a supercomputer that we have three months to spend with. Yeah, well, I can guarantee at least most of us in this room have enough knowledge. Not a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of having the hardware to do it because the only way that you can do many of those things is to recreate all the possibilities. 256-bit key is a lot. But he's gonna. But but where's he? Go, where's he gonna get his supercomputer? The the 
the hashing, the way the process is not. The rainbow file. Oh, yeah, rainbow crack can do that. You know how big the rainbow crack tables are? Uh, I think one of them is like 12 gigs. One of them is like 12 gigs. Yeah. So, yeah. One of them is like, one of them is like, how many of them are there? Thousands. Yeah, I know a guy that was using his Cox Internet download and was trying to download the rainbow tables. It used to be illegal to have them. He was downloading them for three weeks and still hadn't gotten the first one. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, can you do it? Yeah. Got a supercomputer? Yeah. Like one of those crazy supercomputers? Yeah. It costs like $2 million. It costs like $2 million. Yeah. Yes, the 256-bit encryption has been cracked. It was cracked in England. It took... Three months. England? Yep. Look, three months. Took three months and a supercomputer to do it. So, can any of this stuff be done? Yeah, but just say, oh, anybody can do that. That's not the case. I challenge you to do that. How's that, huh? The security class. If you crack the 256-bit encryption. Ah, uh, you wouldn't even get clear. Yeah, you, you, you actually might get lucky because if you hit on the hash the first time, you're done. But if you look at how how long passwords are good for, if you put special characters in a password, you go from like 10 years to crack it if it's long enough to a millennium. So, all of those things. This, yeah, yeah. This is I know I I know. I've gone off target, and we're going to go back on topic, and because we're about done with this, and we got to get done for the uh, award ceremony, which is coming in here now. But the backup, the volume shadow copy, and what the volume shadow copy allows you to do now is to copy open files. You remember, for years you've heard, hey, backup is two o'clock in the morning. You got to come in at two o'clock in the morning to do the backup, right? Why would that? Because that's when the fewest number of files were open. You can back up in the middle of the day now if you want. It's going to slow down your server, but the volume shadow copy allows you to make a copy of open files, which you couldn't do before. That's not new in Server 2008. You had that in, in uh, 2003, and, and the later versions of 2000 has, has that capability also. So you can back up. You don't have to do the backup at 3 o'clock in the morning. But one of the thoughts that I think I'd like to put in your mind, or at least to think about, is think about replication, off-site replication. To me, and maybe I'm missing something in that, in that whole argument, but to me that seems to be, <clears throat> with the connectivity that we have today and with the storages that we have today, that seems to me to be the most efficient way, least time-consuming way to do those things. The server backup only NTFS does not back up to tape. Uh oh. Cannot restore Windows Server 2003 backups. Uh oh. Has some restrictions. And this goes back to, I think I said earlier on, maybe part of these restrictions are because large scale people are using third party softwares. There's more control in a lot of third party softwares than there are in the Windows backup. I honestly thought, and this is my own absolute personal opinion, that the NT backup had more resiliency than this new one does. But only NTFS, can't back it up to tape, which means that you're going to have to do a network backup, wide area or local area backup, or back it up to a hard drive. Could be a removable hard drive or it could be an install hard drive. But, but I've been saying the whole time, don't back it up on the same device. So you're really talking about network backups, and you're talking about backing up on the network. We're talking about slowing down our taking network bandwidth, slowing down our network capability. And this can't restore the Windows Server 2003 backups uh, if you back up a Server 2003 with NT backup. You're not going to restore it with a, with a 2008 backup system. Use the backup tool, full backup, incremental backups, <clears throat> only backs up files that are new and have been updated. 
All of this stuff, if you will think back to DOS, we had four basic attributes in DOS, right? And one of those attributes was the A bit, the archive bit. The way backups work when you run a backup program, and there are all sorts of things when it's going to talk about a copy backup doesn't do it, but a backup program is going to reset the archive attribute so that it's been backed up. When you do an incremental backup, it resets the archive bit. What they don't discuss in here, they talk about a custom backup, is a differential backup. We had differential backups in the NT, NT backup system, which didn't reset the archive bit. The difference is here, what you would do is if you did a full backup on Sunday and then you did an incremental on Monday, an incremental on Tuesday, and an incremental on Wednesday, and on Thursday your system failed, <coughs> you go and restore your full backup. Then you restore your Monday incremental, your Tuesday incremental, your Wednesday incremental. A differential, if we did a full backup on Sunday and we did a differential on Monday, a differential on Tuesday, and a differential on Wednesday, and on Thursday the server crashed, we'd install the full, we'd restore the full backup, and then we'd restore our differential backup. Differentials store more data because it doesn't reset the archive bit and it backs up everything. It's been changed since the last full backup. So the amount of data that you're putting on the tape grows on a daily basis. Incremental backups tend to be the same size every day because you, you probably change about the same amount of information. Incrementals, quicker backup, differential, quicker restore. So we're going to back up the server. <clears throat> when you do that, look at what you can do with these things. Once a day, you can back it up more than once a day. These are the kinds of things. This is a new one that Windows has. This is kind of the thing that they're probably going to be interested in in the testing arena, how this works. So watch what happens here as you do those things. Automatically start backups after regular hours or on a specific day. One of the things that I did not find in here, and if you do find, let me know, once a day. What if I only want to back up once a week? Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> what if I don't want to do a full backup every day? Full incremental and custom, the default the default <clears throat> is a full backup, and then you can do the other configurations. But take a look at what the options are in this thing. System state uh, it contains the system state, it contains a full system state is the registry, and when you start talking about domain controllers, it's Active Directory. Active Directory is the system state on domain controllers. <clears throat> Backup wizard, the disaster recovery plan, what's going to happen? We'll do more of that in the, uh, in the security classes. The WB admin command X is the command line in order to manage the uh, backup with. Allows you the recovery of, you notice it doesn't say the backup of, recovery of files, folders, volumes, applications, application data, backup catalog, and this is one of those that the catalog's got to be there. If you, if you corrupt it, you're going to have some issues with it. So I took a lot of time talking about stuff that we'd already talked about once before. This is one of those areas that really is a big deal important to you when you start managing these things because managing disks can get you in a lot of trouble because you start losing data. You're probably going to have to update your resume. Oh, you probably lost your resume and when you lost the rest of the data, so you'll have to redo it. But pay attention to what you can do with these things. What are the capabilities? It is, it is a big deal. Permissions is the other area, and we'll talk about those later on. Permissions is an area that you can get into trouble really quickly with. Backup is something that we don't like to talk about, we don't like to do, because nobody cares about it until the server crashes. And then you don't have your resume still to, back to, to update because it was in the server crash, unless you've got it backed up. 
If you got it backed up, you probably don't need to update your resume. But think about those when you get into get into the areas. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Practice it. You should have a document, step-by-step -step guidance. Who does what? How do you do this thing? Because what if you're not there? What if you got smoke inhalation when the uh, server room burned up and you're in a hospital? Who knows how to do it? Do you have instructions on how to do it? Where, I mean, just basically, like, where are they? Where are the tapes? And practice it. Set the instructions up, give them to somebody, let them try it out. Questions? I know they want in here. Yeah, <laughs>